begin, we'd like to welcome you all to our final lecture for our summer research seminar series. And before we invite Dr. Heller um, to join us, I do have a couple of housekeeping items for you all. So our format will be as follows. After my introduction, we'll have our lecture, and then we'll move forward with um, Q&A and um, closing remarks. As far as Q&A for this session, you all will see a Q&A feature on Zoom. Please select that to type in your question and at the end, Q&A to, to address your question. And so for our lecture today, we have have Dr. Heller, um, who will be discussing nanoengineering for the research diagnosis and treatment of cancer. So Dr. Heller is the head of the Cancer Nanomedicine Laboratory and member of the Molecular Pharmacology Program in the Sloan Kettering Institute at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer and professor in the Department of Pharmacology at Weill Cornell Medicine. His work focuses on the development of nanoscale technologies for the research diagnosis and treatment of cancer. He received his PhD in chemistry from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2010, working in the laboratory of Dr. Michael Strano. Then he completed a Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation postdoctoral fellowship in the laboratory of Robert Langer at the David Pope Institute for Integrative Cancer Research at MIT in 2012. Um, in 2012, he was, became a recipient of the National Institutes of Health Director's New Innovative Award. In 2015, the Kavli Fellow and 2017 recipient of the Pershing Square Sun Prize for Young Investigators in Cancer Research. And um, in 2018, he also became a recipient of the CRS Nanomedicine and Nanoscale Drug Delivery Focus Group Junior Faculty Award. And we're really excited um, to have Dr. Heller um, join us for today's lecture to share his perspective on nanoengineering. And um, we welcome you, Dr. Heller. Thanks again. You're on mute, just unmute yourself. Are you not unable? Okay, I will ask you to unmute then. Let's try this. How'd that work? Perfect, we can okay. hear you now. Thanks. Thank you, and let me... Um, thank let you. me uh, Hi there, good to see you. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Um, let me uh, share my slides. Okay. Can you, does this look uh, right to you? Okay. Just adapt it to perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, good to see you all. Sorry, sorry again, I couldn't be there, but I'm um, glad to be on online and to talk to you and, and happy to. Um, answer any questions and, and talk another time if uh, in person if that if that could work. Um, so I will um, start moving along. These are my disclosures. Um, so I have a little bit of about kind of my career path um, and uh, you know kind of how how things bounced around to where I where I got. Um, so I actually got a bachelor's in history. From Rice University uh, in 2000, um, not exactly the most common way to go into um, uh, into you know, biomedical research, but uh, that's uh, that, that's what I did. Um, I actually uh, then became a middle school science teacher um, right after uh, college. Um, I taught for two years, uh, seventh and eighth grade uh, life science and physical science. Um, and I guess I don't know if when I was teaching middle school science that as as to whether I um, how many, how many students I might have inspired, but but they inspired me, and and uh, and the, the the science inspired me uh, to become a scientist. And so from there, um, I started taking uh, classes, and uh, I did a uh, 
uh, post-baccalaureate uh, classes uh, and research for about a year and a half. Um, and uh, and in um, in chemistry, and um, applied to graduate schools in chemistry, uh, and did my uh, PhD um, at the University of Illinois, uh, working on nanomaterials, and um, and then I did a, a, a additional work in another lab in, in the, at MIT in a, my postdoctoral research, uh, in for for um, two and a half more years, and uh, applied to become a, a professor. And I started my lab at, at Sloan Kettering in, in, in uh, 2012. So definitely a, 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 a non-standard uh, set of um, uh, a background uh, to get to, uh, to science. And I definitely couldn't have predicted where I'd end up, but I'm happy to answer any questions about career directions, et cetera, uh, at the end. Um, so I um, now I am at Sloan Kettering, I, my lab is uh, in the Zuckerman Research Center, which is uh, right here. And um, and my lab is really uh, a biomedical engineering. I, I call it sometimes nanoengineering because we do nanotechnology, but it's really a, a biomedical engineering lab uh, in a cancer center, which is is fairly rare because most because there's no engineering school uh, in most medical centers. So. Um, it's uh, so having a kind of uh, a biomedical engineering um, background and, and, and direction is uh, is fairly unique, although getting more common in biomedical research centers. And one of the interesting things about it is that an engineer is really someone who wants to develop technologies to solve problems. Uh, and then and the nice thing about being at a biomedical center or a cancer center is there's lots of problems to solve and lots of questions to answer. And so there's an uh, infinite number of collaborations that we could have to, to, to work with people to uh, and, and people to talk to, to, to understand what problems to, to uh, potentially address with by building new technologies. So it, just in general, Biomedical engineering is uh, it has many different areas. Uh, there's people can make certainly makes devices like surgical and medical devices, uh, imaging, medical imaging like MRI and PET scans, and um, di different diagnostics uh, such as you know gluco te glucose tests to blood tests to certainly other imaging tests like um, in medical imaging. Um, there's the area of drug delivery, which I'm going to talk about a lot more. Um, Regenerative medicine, which is like developing tissues, uh, making synthetic tissues, and trying to regenerate um, uh, tissues that might have gone, you know, become diseased. Uh, drug discovery, uh, uh, tools to develop to, to, to develop new drugs and discover new drugs, uh, and certainly related to that is is research tools, that's the en engineering new technologies to try to um, see things in biology to understand things in biology and, and to make, uh, and to make new discoveries, uh, that couldn't have been made before without these new technologies. So my work is kind of mixed in with some of, some of these, I'm going to focus only on a, on a couple of them, but, um, biomedical engineering is definitely a growing area and, uh, becoming more integrated in kind of biomedical research, uh, centers like this one. So my lab, um, we think of ourselves as certainly engineers, and we collaborate with um, a lot of different biology labs, which are all around us at Sloan Kettering and Cornell uh, Medicine. We, we interact with biologists to make new research tools to accelerate research and, and make new discoveries that couldn't have been made before, and also new drug discovery tools to find new ways to, to discover um, uh, molecules um, that might be useful in, in treating uh, disease. And we also collaborate with uh, with uh, with doctors, um, maybe not exactly the doctors you see here, here um, which are from TV, TV but uh, but maybe ones like them. And uh, we work with them to um, uh, to to understand uh, diseases, to, to make new diagnostics and new therapies that could address uh, disease, especially cancer. And so we work closely with with all these types of people. And um, and so I'm going to talk about three stories. I'll try to do. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try to show you a little bit of, of kind of three main areas that our work uh, uh, covers. Um, the first is on the dr drug delivery and getting drugs across barriers in the body, like uh, barriers uh, of, of tissues that might stop drugs from getting to where they need to go. Um, new tools that could monitor um, uh, processes in the body and then the cells in cells for 
uh, developing new drugs and um, also diagnostics. Um, and this is, and there's a special kind of diagnostic area called liquid biopsy. Um, I'm going to start with the, the drug delivery. So one area we uh, issue we found when we when I first started my lab is that there's many different kinds of drugs, um, and many of these drugs that people are developing these days are are in the class of what they call precision medicines. And precision medicines are are uh, medicines that don't just say kill cells like kill cancer cells and uh, and and you hope that they can kill more cancer cells than than human cells, but really hit. Uh, you know, inhibit certain uh, molecules that are uh, that are driving cancer or other disease processes, and so really uh, molecules that might um, really have much more to do with a specific mutation in a in a cancer. And and the the issue is that even though precision medicines have more precision than many of the older kinds of medicines that people have made, they're they're still not um, that precise, and they have all different say toxicities, and these are just lists of different toxicities that uh, occur in certain types of, in, in different kinds of precision medicines. And they all have different issues and not just toxicities, but maybe the drugs don't get to where they need to be, et cetera. And so we realized that every different drug has a different problem. And we wondered how we can um, make technologies to address this. Um, and so we thought about the idea that, you know, many of these precision medicines, another word for precision medicine is basically a targeted therapy. And the reason they're targeted is that they that they might inhibit certain proteins along a pathway of, dis of disease. And these are two major cancer pathways um, that are all related to the RAS gene. Um, and so um, this is one kind of precision, molecular precision of molecules that can inhibit certain bind and, and, and stop certain um, proteins that, that uh, that when if they keep doing their work, they'll uh, create more cancer cells or, or more or, or cancer um, uh, prol proliferating. Um, but the other issue, idea of targeted, is is the idea of targeted drug delivery, where we can get a drug to go where we want, and maybe even avoid the the places in the body where uh, the drugs can cause toxic effects. Then that could really improve the precision of precision medicines, or maybe improve the targeting or target in two different ways. Um, uh, a, a disease a pathway and also a disease location. And so we thought about this and one big issue in this area is how you get drugs to um, brain cancers and other brain diseases because the there's this um, barrier called the blood brain barrier where drugs really can't get in into the brain um, uh, very well. And so many drugs, one has to give a lot higher doses um, of a drug than one normally might might want to, to allow them to do their work in the brain and to stop a cancer in the brain, but that amount might cause toxic effects in many other parts of the body. And so we've been thinking about this, and and we've um, and we we really really ran into this question. We started collaborating with someone, or really ran into someone named Praveen Raju, who's um, now uh, about thirty blocks up from here at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and he asked this question of you know can you get your these technologies to go across the blood-brain barrier, and he had, and, and then the tool he had was a, a, a mouse model of um, medulloblastoma, and actually it's the SHH stands for the sonic he hedgehog gene, and so the sonic hedgehog-driven medulloblastoma is this certain kind of brain disease that only happens in the cerebellum, in the back of the brain, and um, and this this model of this disease, this is in a mouse brain. Um, uh, is, is interesting because it has an intact blood-brain barrier when many um, models of disease don't really recapitulate this, this uh, disease very well because they, they have leaky uh, a leaky blood-brain barrier and, and things can kind of just get in there. But we know that in people, it's, a, it's not a leaky barrier. And in many other diseases, this barrier is, is very, the blood-brain barrier is really a barrier. It's intact. And so having this model in hand, we we had to, we with collaborating with Praveen, we realized we could um, really try to understand our um, and make new technologies uh, that could get across this barrier. And so this is just showing that this barrier is intact and that that things go get into these specific types of, of mice mouse brains. And we also realized that um, that if that there are good potential drugs that could address this brain cancer, which is actually a, a childhood brain cancer, pediatric uh, brain cancer, medulloblastoma, um, but the drugs that that uh, inhibit the part of this pathway, uh, this pathway, and uh, can 
uh, these precision medicines that that uh, stop the, the the cancer um are toxic in children because um they can actually uh stop the the growth plates of uh, bones from growing and to basically cause dwarfism in, in children so one can't really give the um these uh this drug to children at least at the dose is needed to um uh to have any good uh, effects and so you know, and so what, what we wondered is what kind of technology we could make uh, to address this. And we have uh, been making these nanoparticles. And these particles, they target the, um, the tumor endothelium, the blood vessels that feed a tumor. And, um, and the way we do that is we've been thinking about this process that happens in, in blood vessels in, in, in everywhere, which is that when you have a wound or a site of inflammation in a, in, in a, in a, near a blood vessel, um, the blood vessels turn on a bunch of molecules. And one of those types of molecules is called P-selectin. And that molecule shows up on the blood vessel wall. And what it does is that it allows white blood cells that can treat infection and treat cuts and wounds um, to go and to, to, to get to, to stop at, in the blood vessel wall to kind of start, they start rolling in the blood vessel wall because they've been sticking to this molecule P-selectin. And um, and then the blood the white blood cell can actually get outside of the of this of this blood vessel and then treat the wound or treat the infection. And so we thought this is really neat. This is a way to get a type of cell that might be just flowing around the blood in the body to get to the site of a disease. And we thought, you know, can we make technologies that do similar things to this, really that do the same thing, but can carry a drug there instead of just be a, a white blood cell. And so. We've been making particles um, that uh, that target nanoparticles that target this uh, this this, this the, the the p selectin on uh, blood cells but uh, on the on the on blood vessels the same way that white blood cells do. Um, we found that p selectin is in many kinds of cancers. It's it shows up there, um, and many might in part because p selectin is basically a, uh, uh, turns on in a wound, and a cancer acts kind of like a wound that never heals. And so P-selectin, our, our molecules, is there often in, in tumors. But when it's not there, and it's not always there in tumors, we can turn it on with radiation. And even in relatively low doses of radiation, you can turn on P-selectin because it basically causes, uh, radiation kind of causes like a wound or inflammation uh, in a tumor. And, um, and in, in all brain cancers, radiation is used uh, to treat it. So that's actually really works well with the idea of, of, make, of turning on a target of our particles by irradiating a, a tumor because you really need to irradiate well, these tumors, uh, always need to irradiate these tumors. And so we made our particles um, that bind P-selectin out of fucoidin, which is a polysaccharide. It's a, like a starch of sugar that is extracted from brown algae in the Sea of Japan. And so uh, these brown algae produce a lot of this, this polysaccharide um, fucoidin. And this polysaccharide uh, resembles, it, it binds to P-selectin and it binds to P-selectin because it has certain structural similar similarities to the natural binding ligand, the natural thing that P-selectin normally binds to. And so we thought that's really neat. We can potentially use this, this material to make a particle that is loaded with drugs that can we can target to, to diseases. And we just make it really briefly this way. We take a drug and we add, mix it with fucoidin. And we also include a dye, which actually kind of helps stabilize the particle as well, but lets it let the particle glow so we can see where the particle is going. And um, we do this, this um, we, we mix these together in either, you know, in different kind of solvents and, and mix them together in a certain way in a process called nanoprecipitation. And we can get particles that look like this nanoparticles that are maybe less than hundred nanometers in size, uh, which means that maybe, uh, maybe a thousand or a hundred to a hundred thousand times smaller than the width of a human hair. And, um, and so these or maybe closer to 10,000 times smaller than the width of a human hair. And so these uh, particles, we're making them out of a couple of things, either for coitin or this other polysaccharide dextran sulfate, which doesn't bind to P-selectin. So we use it as a kind of control particle. And um, we make, can make particles all different, out of all different kinds of drugs uh, this way. And uh, that's really useful because different people have uh, that are researching and developing new drugs, um, they all have different problems. So we want to try to make particles that can try to target target uh, these drugs to different uh, to, to tumors. And so we have a way to collaborate with many different people at a center like this. Um, 
And we also found that these particles, they bind to blood vessels um, because when they're inflamed or irradiated because the P-selectin has been turned on in these blood vessels. So we made these particles with these, um, loaded up in the middle of these particles with this drug, Vismotigib, which is this um, sonic hedgehog pathway inhibitor. And it makes nice particles. And we started uh, asking the question, well, we, when we inject it into a mouse that has this special type of tumor, this type of tumor, tumor model that I mentioned with the pictures of the mouse brains before, um, if we inject it in this tumor model, um, will it go to the brain? And so that was our main question. Um, first, to see if it will this technology could be useful uh, in targeting the brain and can it get actually across the blood-brain barrier. And um, when we gave this to a, um, a, a normal mouse, WT means wild type mouse, so a, a mouse without the tumor, you see it kind of in it lighting up blood vessels in the brain, but not going really across blood vessels. Uh, even when you radiate the tumor, this is with one gray of radiation, which is actually a very low dose of radiation. Um, and when we take this non-wild type mouse, this, this, this brain tumor mouse, sonic hedgehog uh, medulloblastoma mouse, we don't give radiation to it. Maybe there's a little bit of, of fluorescence of light from these particles that is um, uh, outside of the, that is in the, in this brain tumor region, but outside the blood vessels, but not a whole lot. And this is just saying we're giving, we call these particles five is fucoidin vismotigib particles. And this is the dose. And, um, but then if we irradiate this, this tumor with the one gray of radiation, just a little bit of radiation, we see a big difference that this particle is getting outside the blood vessels into the area where the tumor is, which is only in the back of the brain, the cerebellum, uh, not in the forebrain, uh, which is not where the tumor is. And so we were really, really excited about that, that we could potentially get these particles across the blood-brain barrier and outside of these blood vessels. Lots of different questions that we have to answer after we saw this, but this was really exciting to us when we first saw this light up the, the tumor in the brain. Uh, one thing we wanted to do is figure out, well, is this really due to P-selectin? And we actually um, gave this other particle that was made with dextran sulfate, not with fucoidin that binds to P-selectin. And it, we show that it doesn't get across. So, so it really was probably relating to the P-selectin. We did, and we, then we got even a lower dose of radiation and, a, uh, and a, uh, just to see if this was happening, if we could give you know, really, really low doses of radiation that could still turn on P-selectin, we can. And another control kind of experiment we did was knocking out the uh, P-selectin out of this model. Uh, and uh, CELP is the gene name of P-selectin. And when we did that, you don't see the, P the, the, the particles get out of the blood-brain barrier anymore. And so we think this is really getting out of the blood-brain barrier because of um, targeting P-selectin. And when we did um, a, a, just looked at the drug itself, we saw that kind of to confirm that what we saw before, that it really is getting outside, getting into the cerebellum, which is where the, the tumor is. Um, and when we start doing experiments to see if this is really working and really treating the tumor, we first looked at this protein called GLE-1, which is basically in the pathway of, of um, the, uh, the, the hedgehog pathway. And when we gave radiation and these particles, we found that that really could inhibit this this target or this kind of protein in this pathway really well, uh, much better than just the free drug at the same dose, uh, which wasn't inhibiting it at all. So that was exciting. And then when we treated these these mice, and we treated the mice um, really when they were about to die, because these mice, when they get when we diagnose them with the cancer, basically they're starting to walk kind of strangely, and they're going to die like really soon. And so. If mice, untreated mice died within three to four days. But when we treated uh, mice and all the mice were treated only for 16 days. So we didn't do this treatment forever. We actually had to stop it um, uh, because otherwise we would kind of just be doing this work forever. Um, so, but just to see, we stopped it at day 16 and we either treated the mice with the particles, with the free drug or with a combination of or radiation or a combination of the, the particles and, and radiation. And we found that if we gave the radiation alone every other day for eight days, it did kind of stop the tumor somewhat. And if we gave the particles alone, which is green, or the green uh, uh, green here, that also kind of inhibited the, the tumor. Uh, and this is showing, you know, each time this 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 bar kind of steps down, that's one mice di mouse dying. And what we found is that only when we gave a combination of the particles and the 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 uh, and the radiation, uh, we really get a big difference uh, from the other groups. And so that was exciting. We've since done this with other kinds of drugs and, and we can even get better results than this. So we were really excited about this. And we also wanted to know, well, can we avoid these toxic effects from the drugs? 
like um, the fact that this drug, when given at doses that are effective in the free drug form, can can keep can cause dwarfism in children, but also in in young mice. And we found that if you don't give the if you give the particles, which is at lower doses of drug, um, but uh, at the same at, 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 and if you give these particles instead of the the free drug at the doses that that work the same way, um, you don't. Uh, cause this dwarfism of these mice, and you don't kind of inhibit their femur lengths and their bone densities and, and other bone defects. So we were excited about that. We also wanted, but we wondered, like, what what is it? Why is this going across the blood-brain barrier? What, what's going on here? Um, and so what we uh, we were uh, inspired by some colleagues that had published papers uh, before us, uh, finding that the that the, it was thought that particles can get into tumors because of leakiness. Of blood vessels, but this group found that 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 leakiness of blood vessels doesn't really account for all the 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 ability of of particles to get into tumors. And so people have found that if you inject a a, 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 a particle of these nanoparticles in mice that have tumors, their tumors are very leaky, and they, the particles can get just go there. But um, this people have been finding that that's actually not just because of leakiness; that there must be some sort of active process. Uh, and so we were inspired by that. And we looked at active processes that uh, that allow particles to go across and other things to go across blood vessels. Um, and cavioli, or the cavioli, caviolin one, is a protein showed that shows up uh, that are part of this kind of endocytosis pathway, uh, a pathway where where um, material can go across blood vessels. And what we found is that when we looked at caviolin one, it was turned on when we gave particles. Not just, by, but not radiation only. Uh, and so we thought that maybe that this this pathway is turning on this this uh, allowing um, allowing the particles to go across the blood the blood brain barrier. And so we did this study in a in a well plate or in what it's called a transwell assay, which is where we grew these cells blood cells from blood vessels, uh, brain endothelial cells, on this little kind of porous membrane. And we put particles on the top of the membrane, which is, and it's all in, it, all these particles are in, um, you know, the, the, the cell media. And we put the particles on the top, they can get across the, the blood vessel and across this membrane only if uh, the particles can, can transcytose, can get across the blood, the, this, this, this blood vessel barrier. Um, and what we found is that if we knock out the um, caviolin one, we can prevent this from from going across, but if we but the normally these particles would just go across these blood vessels. So that suggests that maybe this cavioli pathway, uh, this this kind of transport pathway, is is causing this this migration of particles across the blood-brain barrier. And we kind of looked at that in in by, by a bunch of imaging where we made particles out of gold that are coated with this phacoidin and found that it shows up in these uh, mouse endothelial cells in the brain. And um, we also knocked out this caviolin pathway out of this model of, of the medulloblastoma and found that the particles still seem to stick to the blood vessels, partially potentially because the, the, the P-selectin is there, but they don't get across the blood vessels and, and get into across the blood-brain barrier to, so they couldn't treat the mouse then if we knock out this, this, um, uh, this, this, this pathway. So we are kind of getting to this Kind of model where we think that, or idea where we think that this this p selectin, which we are making these particles that bind to that that you know that um, normally uh, you know normally it's blood vessels or blood cells, white blood cells that bind to p selectin, but this is a an endothelial cell, so a cell on a you know blood vessel on the blood brain barrier, and we we found is that these particles can bind to p selectin on the on the blood vessel, and that turns on this this transport pathway of caviolin transcytosis, and I never really showed you what this looks like, but caviolin, uh, basically cavioli are caves, are little mean caves in Latin. And and basically what happens in this pathway is that little caves form and can bring materials across this blood vessel and let them off on the other side. And that's really neat because that enables, by by harnessing this pathway of this, this, uh, of this cavioli, transcytosis, it can allow things to get across this barrier and into a tumor to, to treat the tumor. And so I'm going to summarize this really quick because um, I have a couple other things to tell you, but I'll probably skip a couple of things because I don't want to go too long. But I will tell you that, uh, that just to summarize this part of the talk, uh, P-selectin enables uh, leukocytes to leave the bloodstream at, at sites of, the, of activated endothelium. And um, P-selectin uh, targets nanoparticles 
uh, or P selectin, when we use these P selectin targeted nanoparticles, they can cross its intact blood brain barrier and improve tumor drug localization, improve the effect of the tumors of the, of the, of the drug, and prevent toxicities in this tumor model, this genetic uh, engineered uh, mouse model. And we found that this P selectin and caviolin kind of work together to enable this trans endothelial transport, this, this transport across the blood brain barrier. And these are the, some of the people that did this work. And there were more than just these people, but these are the people that kind of led this work. And it, it's interesting story of, of how this all happened. And it was really someone in my lab uh, that uh, collaborated with uh, Addy here, who's at Sloan Kettering, who's a radiation biologist for us to understand this, this radiation idea of that we can turn on radiation. And then a pediatric neurologist, uh, Praveen Raju, who, who, worked, who asked the question of, can we cut across the blood brain barrier? And so, and that, and these are the student and uh, a physician that worked on these uh, at the bench for most of this this time. So that was uh, a really interesting way to to think about how um, uh, a, a really interesting kind of uh, story of how we all got together and 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 made these findings. Um, I'm going to try to do everything else really quick because I don't want to take too long. The other areas of my work are focus on um, the uh, on on sensors. And uh, I mentioned these two kind of areas of sensors, these sensors for drug discovery and these sensors for liquid biopsy. I'm maybe going to talk a little bit about each one, but I have to go really fast because I don't want to take too much time. But the idea here is that, um, is that why, why do we want to make sensors? And so there's many different reasons uh, in a, in a bio for, making, for making biosensors. And one is that, that we want to increase the, the speed of measurements or the throughput of measurements. Um, this is a Western blot, which often kind of works really slowly. But if we can make that faster to get lots and lots of data much, much faster, that would be really exciting. And so um, that's, you know, one thing that we could do with sensors is to, is to or uh, sensors that we're making is to try to make measurements faster. Uh, one is to quantify them. So if you can get an image like this from an electron microscope, that's nice. But what if, how do you quantify this? Can you put, make numbers out of this, especially if you want to measure things inside there, like different chemicals and, and how much of different, different say, proteins are in this area uh, or in this, in this picture. Um, and also what about, you know, this is a, a stain from, a, from, a, from, from, a, from tissue from a person, but this stain is, is, a, is a, or a microscope image of cells that are stained is, is all dead tissue. And, and, what, and, and if, if you can measure things when they're alive, you can measure processes in the body and chemicals that are forming and, and going away in the body. And so that would be um, very useful. And also, can you measure things in situ, like in the body? Like instead of just taking stuff out of the body to do a diagnosis, can you put things in the body to make a measurement? And so we do a lot of the, these, um, we make sensors that, that can potentially do a lot of this stuff, not all at once. And so I'm gonna give you a couple examples uh, about what we're doing, but I just wanna show you kind of how we're doing it. Um, so we're making, using new types of materials that give off light. And that's how we're transmitting the information from the body or from a cell into say a microscope or detector that, to, to do the measurement. Um, and so what we have here, this is a carbon nanotube and a carbon nanotube is this rod of carbon that's 100,000 times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. And this rod, it gives off light um, because it's natural properties of, uh, even though it's just all carbon, it's the properties of how the electrons can move in this material uh, allow it to give off light. And that light comes in, is in the infrared. Um, and which that means is that that light can transmit through tissue. And there's many different ways that we can, uh, that, and the nice thing about that, that the, those um, materials is that they give a very stable fluorescence uh, light uh, that can transmit through tissue and that that light can be changed when things get really close to the nanotube. Like things can quench and increase or decrease the intensity of the nanotube. Things can shift the light in its wavelength, its color. Um, and we can also add little extra chemical groups to these nanotubes that can also change the chemical uh, sensitivity of these things. And so there's many different sensitivities that these nanotubes have. Um, and that's really useful because um, we can make sensors that are detect that can be, be, be sensitive to many, many different things. Um, now, what we had to do to make these useful is to also make new technologies. So we collaborated with people and in our lab, we developed new technologies and we collaborated with companies to make um, um, new devices like 
uh, hyperspectral imaging uh, microscopes, microscopes that could look at all these different colors of these nanotubes. They all There's actually many different kind of colors of nanotubes, all in the infrared, um, that are all glowing at different wavelengths. And also they can, each different nanotube can shift, as I mentioned before, which means that we can get lots of information out of these things if we can just measure them in different ways. So we're making these, uh, working uh, working to, to develop new these new kinds of microscopes uh, and new ways to get um, light out of mice that uh, or animals that could um, tell us something about diseases if we can make if we, when we make sensors that that uh, detect diseases inside of these mice uh, and also we want to we want to make really high throughput measurements that could actually um, measure many many things that can help with discovering drugs for instance and we've collaborated with the company now to make kind of uh, a new uh, a, a, a reader that can measure these these sensors really really fast, and so this is just an example of what a, high, a, a drug discovery plat a robot looks like, which is not in our lab, but but in many companies uh, where they screen drugs using many 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 um, uh, compounds uh, and uh, and maybe do some sort of measurement that can re that can get um, that can can measure something from a, a disease process maybe in a cell that can allow uh, people to, to select drugs that could um, be useful in, a, in a treating a certain disease. And so this drug discovery idea, um, uh, there, there's many, many types of technologies now that or many, many people that want to find new drugs. There's no, not always infinite number of, of kind of sensors and probes that can measure what you want inside of a cell or an animal. So just kind of some, some of the types of sensors we've been and tools we've been making with these, with these um, nanotubes have been things like sensors for certain types of fusion proteins, uh, proteins that uh, people engineer to, to tag different other kinds of proteins. Um, there's certain types of enzymes that are that inactivate, and one of, this is one name of one of the types of inactivation, the suicide inactivation pathway that basically makes an enzyme stop working, which is very, certainly very um, important in certain drug in certain um, uh, diseases. Uh, we have a sensor for that. We've made sensors that can be implanted in the body um, to detect things like uh, microRNA and also proteins involved in ovarian cancer. And so we've been making kind of these sensors that work in cells or uh, or in animals, and we want to know things about them to try to uh, understand um, uh, disease. And so I want to kind of uh, switch gears really quick because I have too many things in this presentation. I'm just going to have to go go to the little end of this uh, uh, of this um, presentation for a second. So let me just do this. Um, so let me go to the very this part. Um, so what we have is a what we've been making recently is a, a spectral fingerprint of disease states. Um, and we want the the idea here is that. Um, is that we want to make new diagnostics, and so one issue is that um, ovarian cancer is one example of a cancer where it's very hard to detect a cancer, but if if it can be detected at early stage disease, which is called lo you know localized disease, which is not metastatic disease, which is usually later stage disease or more advanced disease, uh, it can be treated uh, much better, and so the five year survival of ovarian cancer is very high when it's detected when it's localized, but when it's distant, it's a much more difficult to treat. And, uh, and, and the five-year survival of ovarian cancer is fairly bad when, uh, especially this, uh, this certain kind of ovarian cancer, high-grade serious ovarian cancer, um, there's, you know, there's not that many cases a year compared to other kinds of cancers, but there's, but many of those, uh, of those, can uh, those cases result in death of patients because it's very hard to treat at late stages. Um, and so the question is, well, can we detect it at early stage? And the problem is that we can, uh, that, that uh, localized disease is only detected in 15% of patients. And most, uh, in most patients, it's detected much later in, at advanced stages when it's metastasized. And so can we make a sensor that detects uh, ovarian cancer at early stages? And so uh, many, you know, there, most of the kind of markers, biomarkers that people want to have looked at for ovarian cancer, there may be a single antigen, a single protein, and people make sensors for these kind of things, uh, recognition-based sensors. You have an antibody and antigen, and you can get a signal out of it. But um, but the problem is that we can't, we don't know enough uh, a good biomarker that could be useful in detecting ovarian cancer early enough. So we've been using this kind of um, uh, this different idea of sensing where. We don't really know exactly what we want to sense, but if we could potentially find that that 
compare looking at all the different things in say the serum of a of a of a patient that has ovarian cancer, um, maybe we can find something if we had a sensor that's not really specific but can kind of detect everything. And the idea comes from uh, how your nose works: is that you have only about four hundred olfactory receptors, but you can recognize over a trillion cells or a smell different smells. And the and the reason is that um, you have maybe uh, you have um, that this combination of different receptors of how they uh, of how they um, uh, uh, how they work. Um, basically, this if you can uh, if you have kind of a you get a fingerprint of kind of a smell by different smell a different kind of odor molecule or set of odor molecules sticking to these different four hundred different receptors. They create a pattern, and your brain can decipher that pattern and tell you what you're smelling. And so people have been making arrays of sensors, multiple different sensors that can bind to uh, not just one thing at a time, but many different things. Um, maybe we call them like a less selective sensor, a, non, a moderately or non-specific sensor. But these different sensors, they kind of create a fingerprint. And now with different computational tools like machine learning, AI, we can get do pattern recognition of what are what sensors bind to what um, uh, uh, or what. Uh, different kind of molecules, and we get a pattern out, and we can maybe use that pattern with machine learning to kind of recognize disease. And the way we've done this is we make an array of our different nanotube sensors, we put them into a well plate, and we do high throughput measurements of basically blood from patients mixing with these different sensors that are not really very specific to any one thing, but maybe really bind to many things. And we make a big set of data, and we train that data, train an algorithm, and we basically tell the algorithm. This, these patients, the blood from these patients that are sticking to these sensors that are giving these responses, which look like kind of changes in signals of the of our sensor, uh, these this particular set of pa patients' uh, responses, those are all cancer, and these are all not. And then we tell the, the model that, you know, which ones are cancer, which ones are not, which the, what the sensors, uh, the, and the sensors have basically uh, responded in many different ways or given different signals. Uh, and we have a bunch of different sensors and we're getting maybe 24 different signals from them. And then uh, based on those responses, we can basically make a fingerprint uh, and the algorithm now knows which of these responses look like disease and which ones look like uh, uh, healthy. Um, and so we took blood from many patients. We took all these different types of sensors and we mixed them together and we get these, these signals, which look like this, uh, these little curves. And we feed this information into, uh, we kind of, we, we take this, all this information from all these different patients and we can get this big heat map. And this is all different response data from our different uh, sensors. And each one of these is a different sensor and each little column here is a different patient. And we have this data and now we tell the algorithm, can you, know, can you differentiate healthy from disease? And when we did this optimization of these algorithms, we found that we actually could, that, um, that although you know, if we just use our normal kind of uh, analysis methods and look with our eyes, we couldn't of these patterns, we couldn't see anything. But with this uh, algorithm, it can tell us that actually it has a, ba a ba like a ninety-four to ninety-five percent sensitivity and specificity for disease, um, and that's really good. That's better than the known markers that are out there for the disease. It's not good enough, maybe, to tell us uh, the difference between um, cancer and um, at a very early stage yet. And so we want to keep improving this, but it's definitely better than the, the, the markers that we're already using to, to detect this disease, the, the biomarkers. And so we're really excited about that. Um, and we're trying to figure out now, now that we have a sensor that things are binding to, we also want to figure out what's causing the binding. And we found out that with our analysis that we found out that there's kind of uh, we know that our, that the proteins that are known to detect can to, to to be useful in cancer can bind to our sensors, but also some of our sensors that are useful for this detection aren't really binding any proteins we actually know already. So this potentially could, if we can wash off our sensors, figure out what's binding to them, we can maybe figure out new markers for cancer, or, or and and figure out why our sensor is working, but also what uh, uh, sensors are. Um, uh, whether we, you know, what markers um, uh, might be uh, useful for detecting this cancer. Um, so we have kind of two things, a way to find new markers in cancer, but also maybe a new kind of uh, diagnostic where we don't even need to know what the markers are that that are involved in cancer. We just kind of have a big mix of, of um, sensors and that can detect many, many things in the blood. And so 
this is kind of an interesting thing because we have this sensor that can be used to ask many different questions and can be uh, and we can continually help uh, improving the model this, these algorithms by just basically using more patient samples. Um, but there's some limitations, which is that now we don't know exactly what we're detecting, even though we're this, this sensor is is giving us this fingerprint of disease. Um, and so we're still uh, we're still trying to learn from this. And these are some of the people that helped in this work or that did this work. This is a postdoc in my work, Mijin, who's uh, going to become a professor very soon, and and she kind of led this work. Uh, and Kara Long Roche is a is a is a surgeon, a gynecologic surgeon uh, who works on ovarian cancer, and she's really uh, worked with us very closely to get this um, uh, to to get this technology work. And she really knows the disease. She's the ovarian cancer doctor. Uh, and Lakshmi Ramanathan is the head of the clinical chemistry. Uh, um, group here at Sloan Kettering, and she involved, she deals with all the blood from all the patients that come in from different parts of the cancer center, and she and 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 builds the, the blood tests that can help to diagnose cancer. Um, and many of the other people helped. They're also engineers and chemists and, and other uh, uh, clinical scientists. And so these are kind of all the other people to thank in my lab and collaborators and, and people who've helped fund this work. Um, and this is uh, our recent group picture, which has now involved us, all of us wearing Team Nano shirts. And um, with that, I will uh, be happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Heller. Um, we do have a few questions that were submitted via the Q&A feature. And I see an attendee, um, Bethany, you have your hand raised. If you'd like to ask the question, um, feel free to... Um, unmute and you can ask your question. Oh, I'm sorry, I did it by accident. Okay, no problem. So we'll um, continue with the other questions submitted. So Tiffany um, is asking, do you think the nanoparticles or similar technologies could be used to detect cells at risk of becoming cancers that are starting to evolve? and possibly disrupt that process before they become cancer by targeting the P-selectin protein their body supply? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. We're, we're trying to, um, uh, we're, we're trying to find new, really understand this uh, P-selectin protein and, and how it's involved in the development of cancer. And so, um, this P-selectin, it turns on in inflammation processes and inflammation can kind of precede cancer sometimes. So that's actually, um, uh, it's, 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 that's actually a really uh, important point that, um, that uh, we're trying to understand still now, that which, which is that uh, P-selectin is uh, kind of, the, this inflammation can often lead to a cancerous state. And so it might be useful to potentially target and uh, the, the, the P-selectin protein um, in uh, that and and potentially uh, prevent certain kinds of inflammation that can lead to cancer. And people are also uh, targeting P-selectin um, for different kinds of disease. Uh, and now I'm, now our particles are binding the P-selectin to try to get a drug a drug to different parts of the body, but not necessarily inhibiting P-selectin. But other people are also doing that, where they're trying to use drugs that inhibit P-selectin. And there are drugs that are already in the clinic that inhibit P-selectin that people are uh, studying in the context of cancer. There's actually a drug that's used for sickle cell pain crisis. Um, it's an antibody drug that people are trying to use to now understand, can you prevent the development of cancer with that drug? So they're kind of repurposing a drug that targets and inhibits P-selectin uh, to make it do, uh, uh, to now investigate it in the context of cancer. Thank you, Dr. Howard. The next question is from Fatima. Um, so they said they're not entirely sure if they're wording this question correctly, but have there been any drugs you tested using nanoformulation approach that do not get the same results you saw in the mouse model? Is there a pattern to the kinds of drugs that are compatible with the P-selectin pathway? Um, so the, um, you know, that's a good, that's a good question. I guess there's a couple of things there. One is the so the P-selectin um, is the this way of potentially, or is this uh, marker that's in the blood vessels 
uh, and the particles target it, and and then we found that they can get across the blood vessels. And so the the thing that's targeting the p-selectin is this polysaccharide that we're making our particles out of. But the drug inside, we can change that up to be all uh, uh, different. And we think that the it doesn't really matter what drug is in the middle of the particle to that in terms of getting it across the the barriers and getting it into the tumors. Um, that if we use this particle that's made with this polysaccharide, this vacoidin, this uh, this um, that comes from the algae, we could um, we can get any kind of drug to a to a tumor or to this across this uh, particular type of uh, of this, these blood vessels. But if we change up the drug, it might it'll have a completely different effect. So some drugs can treat certain tumors really well, and others they're going to be uh, useless. So so it's you have to really choose, you know, for some some tumors will have p selectin, some won't. Some you can turn it on for um, because of radiation, and uh, and then the drugs uh, and, and uh, the, the drugs and what drugs will will be useful against certain tumors are all variable depending on how what kind of a tumor it is, what uh, um, genetic uh, mutations are in that tumor, and so we really have to pick and choose and mix and match and figure out what drugs should be in the middle of the particle and whether this particle. Uh, can actually, with this p-selectin kind of pathway, can actually be useful in getting to the tumor in the first place. Question. Um, they're asking, you briefly mentioned how your senses benefit Western blots and quantification. Can you please go more in depth into this? Um, yeah, so we are trying to make, it was just kind of an, an example uh, that, that I asked, that I kind of mentioned of how we could how people engineers can make new technologies to improve um, uh, the uh, you know measurements in biology, and so I, I realized that one thing that's a kind of a slow throughput type, type of uh, format in the or slow th low throughput kind of um, process uh, or thing you do in in a, in a lab is Western blots, and many people working in a lab uh, know that that's a slow thing, and we would like to make it much faster. Uh, and it would be great if engineers could focus on that and make it faster. I haven't made a nanoparticle that or a nanotube sensor that could replace a Western blot, but I just kind of brought up the idea of how of, of how a lot of these uh, these kind of technologies are slow, and it would be great to make them faster. Our sensors, we can make them detect proteins really fast and make measurements with them really fast, but they still probably the way that we've made them so far, they won't they won't replace a Western blot just yet. But I'm hope, hoping that someone could either use our nanotube nanotube sensors or some other type of technology, maybe to improve and make Western blots really fast. Or, uh, but certainly they can uh, make make new, we can make them into other technologies that could you know make uh, measurements in biomedical context much much faster. Um, but certainly we're not we haven't made the Western blot faster yet. for um, the remaining questions. And we'd like to thank you again for um, today's lecture. So before we come to a close, I did have a couple of housekeeping items and announcements that I'd like to share with our attendees. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. As you all know, we'd like to thank you all again for um, attending our seminar series this summer. We want to remind you, if you'd like to view the seminar recordings, they are listed on our YouTube page here. And secondly, we also wanted to remind you that, okay, to stay connected with us on Twitter, this is where we post all of our updates for all of our HOP education programs. So any um, events that we're having or applications for our programs when they're open, you can find us here on Twitter. And again, we'd like to thank all of our students and attendees for the summer seminar series, and we wish you all a successful summer. Thank you all again and have a good rest of the day. Bye everyone.